So I'm going to uh, do my introduction. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, John Wallace. He's an assistant professor of weed science and extension specialist for field and forage crops at Penn State. His current research interests include herbicide stewardship, integrated weed management tactics for conservation tillage systems, cover crop and herbicide interactions in integrated weed management systems, and organic rotational no-till. Uh, John will be talking to us today about residual herbicide carryover and cover crop establishment. So I think we're right on time, John, if you wanna share your screen. All right, thanks, Jeff. Let's see. Does that look all right? It looks great. Okay. All right, well, thanks and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna to cover today the potential for uh, use of residual herbicides to carry over and injure uh, cover crops. Um, and so I'm just gonna jump right into it um, and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for, for some questions at the end. Um, so when we're talking about herbicide carryover injury, there's really a number of factors that can contribute to that. The first obvious one is um, if there's a misapplication or an error in mixing or um, in a spray pass where you get some uh, doubles um, or more than the 1x uh, herbicide rate is going out. Um, so that's, that's one way that we can see herbicide carryover injury. Um, but even if we're uh, making um, good applications um, without errors, we can end up with the potential for carryover injury. And that's going to depend on uh, the herbicide persistence in the soil. So I'm going to probably talk about persistence and degradation, um, depending on uh, how I'm talking about it. And uh, the other factor is the sensitivity of the rotational crop. And so, of course, we're talking about uh, cover crops um, in, in this uh, instance. And then also soil environment conditions um, between the time of, of application of that residual herbicide and planting uh, of, of the cover crop. And so all those three factors that I'm gonna talk about today interact. Uh, and so there's kind of a lot of variability um, when we weed scientists are asked for recommendations around kind of thinking through this potential for carryover injury, we often are kind of wishy-washy and non-committal, and there's a good reason for that uh, because, um, it, you know, there's a lot of interacting factors to consider. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to spend just a few slides um, kind of going through the basics of what's going on with herbicide breakdown and persistence in the soil as well as cover crop sensitivity. And then I'll get into specifics of corn herbicide programs, uh, soybean programs, and, and wheat programs. So um, just, just knowing something about um, the, the chemical structure of, of these residual herbicides that we use, um, we, we have some sense of how long they'll potentially live in soil. And so that, that kind of work is, is done at the herbicide discovery stage. And so we kind of know, um, you know long-lived herbicides versus short-lived herbicides when it comes to these residual products. Um, and usually there's a number attached to that when we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the length of persistence. And so you might sometimes see a soil half-life um, uh, given for these herbicides. And so the soil half-life is just under these average conditions, what is the length of time for that product to break down by 50% in the soil? All right, so we have short-lived short products that might have a 20 day half-life or shorter. And we have long-lived um, residual herbicide products that might have a half-life uh, you know, greater than 50 days or so. Um, and so what's really driving that, probably the two biggest factors are how water soluble the product is. And then also um, how readily it uh, absorbs to soil particles. And so that's gonna really, those two properties are going to tell us a lot about uh, what proportion of that herbicide is going to be in soil water. And that's going to be particularly important because that's the primary way in which we see herbicides degrade in soil, uh, either through plant uptake, if it's in soil water, 
or moving down through the soil profile or through microbial degradation. And then there's also, um, you know, soil environmental factors that kind of modify or moderate persistence. And so even though we have um, some idea of, of the relative uh, persistence or the half-life of these products, depending on um, the environmental conditions, they can either break down faster or they can stick around longer. And so the biggest um, factors from an environmental standpoint are what are the soil temperatures and soil moisture after you've applied that product. Um, so the higher uh, soil temps get and the more soil moisture you have, those are conditions where we're gonna see high uh, microbial activity. And so those microbes are gonna break down those products at a, at a you know, relative rate or an expected rate. Um, and we're also going to see if we have enough soil moisture, we're going to see those herbicides um, uh, move out of the system, either through plant uptake, weed control, or crop uptake, or moving down uh, below the rooting profile. Um, and so it's, the, it's, the, it's really dry conditions and cooler conditions um, after applying those herbicides where we see uh, them sticking around longer than, than typical. So the other soil factors, um, kind of pro soil properties that also kind of modify the, the relative persistence of these products. Um, soil texture and organic matter are, are big ones. And so um, heavier soils with more clay content, um, they have more binding sites for those herbicides to absorb to. Um, same thing with organic matter. And so heavier soils, higher organic matter, we can see uh, more absorption of those residual uh, products on soil particles. And so they may stick around uh, longer uh, than, than soils that are a little lighter. Um, and then the other thing is soil pH. Um, soil pH is somewhat particular to different modes of action. Um, and it's gonna really change um, that dynamic between water solubility and, and uh, absorption potential. Um, and so I'll just highlight a couple of those uh, as I go along. All right, so having said all that, what, what are really the scenarios that we should be looking out for um, that are gonna kind of raise the likelihood of, of running into a problem when it comes to carryover injury? Well, certainly drought conditions uh, after the time of planting into maybe the middle of the crop growing season are gonna be a big driver of that. So under normal circumstances where we have good weather, good precipitation, crops look good, weed control looks good, uh, those herbicides are probably breaking down um, as expected in the soil. So microbial activity is breaking them down, um, crop uptake, uh, weed uptake. Um, but also um, there's the element of time, right? So time to um, planting that next crop or the cover crop and so, um, you know, in corn and soybean programs, we're starting to use uh, residual products um, later um, as a post-emergence product. So some of these products have uh, foliar activity and residual activity, or we're applying these res residual products with our post products in order to lengthen uh, the amount of soil activity that we have to control some of these more difficult weeds. And so, Pushing uh, those applications later into the crop growing season, especially if that kind of comes with um, around a period of you know drier um, conditions, uh, that can also raise the likelihood of, of some uh, carryover injury issues. And then shorter rotation intervals. So um, you know a summer or two ago, we had a lot of prevent plant acres where residuals went out. We wanted to get something out there, a cover crop or, or replant corn. So those types of circumstances. Um, we're doing a lot of work at Penn State um, in, in relay cover cropping, so interseeding cover crops in corn. So we're coming back uh, much sooner uh, in comparison to post-harvest seeding. And so that's another case where carryover injury is a significant concern. Uh, and then also, you know, um, corn silage acres are, you know, if we're using some of these longer lived products are going to uh, and we're trying to get a cover crop established after corn silage in the middle of September in comparison to, you know, November after corn grain. Uh, those are also, you know, potentially spots in the rotation where we might need to consider uh, the potential for carryover injury. 
Okay, so the other thing is, is um, it's not just understanding, you know, um, uh, how the herbicide breaks down in the soil and what that looks like um, for different herbicides. It's also how sensitive uh, is the rotational crop to those specific herbicides. And we have a good idea of um, cash crop uh, sensitivity. Um, so that's gonna be reflected in rotation intervals on the label. We also have a pretty good sense of what weeds are more or less sensitive to a lot of these um, uh, residual herbicides, but we have less knowledge right now about how cover crops differ in their sensitivity to some of these residual products. And so uh, we're trying to generate um, uh, some data to, to get at that type of question. Um, and so we can take the approach that we would, you know, kind of think about using when we think about um, sensitivity of, of different weed species to um, these residual products. So we're likely to see differences uh, across plant families. So we, we typically are using either a grass cover crop or a brass cover or a legume. Um, and a lot of these products, we see big differences in sensitivity depending on the size of uh, the weed seed, right? So we can apply that same type of thinking, perhaps larger cover crop seeds are gonna be less sensitive uh, than smaller cover crop seeds. And then the last thing is, um, even if we know some of those factors, um, the environmental conditions at the time of planting that cover crop may also influence sensitivity uh, to these uh, small doses of the residual herbicide that might be left. Uh, so if it's, if it's um, you're seeding into kind of stressful conditions with, uh, you know, maybe, um, you know, periods of drought after establishing that cover crop, they may, that might also contribute to um, carryover issues. Oops. All right, so just to, um, so, so just as an example, um, so, some of the work that we've been doing at Penn State has been actually using greenhouse experiments to understand how some of these uh, different cover crop species that, that people are interested in uh, differ in their sensitivity to corn or so soybean herbicides. So this is a, just an example of looking at crimson clover sensitivity to Callisto or mesotrione. And we're simulating kind of that degradation in the soil. And so we're applying uh, different doses from a field 1x field rate all the way down to very low rates. And you can see that um, even down to about an eighth of the active ingredient that we applied at the 1x rate, we're still getting complete control or 100% injury of crimson clover. And so that would suggest that um, crimson clover is, is, is highly sensitive uh, to Callisto and, and, and may, um, there may be a, a cause for concern um, as far as carryover injury. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into kind of and move across um, some of the main modes of action that we use um, in both corn and soybean programs for, for residual weed control. Um, and I'm gonna start with uh, the group 15 herbicides and I'm including a group, a group three in here too. And these herbicides, uh, if you're using premixed products, um, they're, they're really the product that's providing a lot of that residual control for annual grasses. And these uh, products are also going to provide some weed control for smaller seeded uh, broadleaf weeds as well. Um, and a lot of these products are going out as a pre at planting, um, but they can also uh, go out post-emergence in both corn uh, and soybean for the most part. You can see there in the figure, the latest application date or the application window for applying these products. Um, so there's gonna be a, a range uh, depending on the product. Um, so uh, really these are, there's a few other residuals that have uh, grass activity, um, but really these group 15 herbicides are gonna cause the greatest uh, potential for carryover injury to grass cover crops, okay? And so what our work has shown is that um, we've done a fair number of field trials over the past four or five years uh, looking at this group of chemistry and their potential to injure uh, seeded cover crops. 
And so I feel pretty comfortable suggesting that this is kind of the relative ranking of the potential for injury. So Zidua products um, and dual products are, are persist longer in the soil uh, and, and really have a greater potential for, for carryover injury in comparison to harness or outlook products. Um, having said that, when we look at it in the field, despite you know, being able to see some differences, um, for the most part, under normal conditions, if you're post-harvest seeding a cover crop, even in corn silage, um, you know, you're four and a half months out after uh, that residual herbicide application, um, you're, you're pretty much under normal conditions, you'll be able to seed winter cereals without much issue. Um, where we do see, um, you know, a greater likelihood of, of some injury is with annual ryegrass. And so annual ryegrass is a, is a smaller seeded uh, grass cover crop in comparison to those winter cereals and is pretty sensitive to these group 15 herbicides. Um, and so if, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, dairy farmers who like to seed, you know, um, triticale and annual ryegrass after corn silage, uh, and if they're using uh, residual products in their corn programs, they might think about going with a, a lighter group 15 herbicide like Harness or Outlook in their program rather than these longer lived residuals like Sidua and Dual. So if you look um, again, so from a weed control standpoint, these group 15 herbicides are also providing some control of small seeded broadleaf weeds. So they have activity on these small seeded broadleafs and so we think there's some concern for carryover injury to smaller seeded legume or brassica cover crops. Um, and so we don't have a, a lot of data um, and, and there's you know, fewer legumes and, and, and brassicas going out uh, in comparison to winter cereals. So we don't see this in a field context as much. Um, but some of the greenhouse work that we've been doing suggests that there is some differences in relative sensitivity of some of these cover crops uh, to these different group 15 herbicides. What I'm showing here is just an example of that where we can see that, um, let's say you're using uh, these products in, in corn, in your corn program, and you wanna come back maybe after corn silage and integrate a cover crop mixture that would include a brassica. We can see that uh, the brassica cover crops are much more sensitive uh, to zidua than they are to dual. So there may be some opportunities to, to identify the right residual product where there's um, some tolerance of these cover crop species uh, in order to, to get some mixtures out. Okay, so again, if you're, if you're using residuals in a corn program and you're using a premixed product, most likely that premix is gonna include two or three modes of action. And so you're gonna have a group 15 herbicide likely and, that's, and then you're gonna have a group 27 with uh, very likely atrazine as a premix. Um, so so this is, these are triazine herbicides, atrazine and metribuzin. Uh, we're using a lot more metribuzin in soybeans these days uh, as a residual product. Um, and so I wanted to point out um, the kind of the current thinking around uh, the potential for residual carryover injury from atrazine. Um, historically, before my day, I think, uh, especially in, in tilled uh, ground, there's a lot more cases of atrazine carryover injury that may have been doing, um, certainly in, in continuous corn or where metribuzin was also being used um, in the soybean phase. Um, but what recent research has shown is that um, the, the, the persistence of atrazine is probably much lower than we uh, had thought previously. Um, and so what, what the research has shown is that if, you're, um, have a lot, if you have a history of atrazine use, so if you're growing continuous corn or even corn in a short rotation uh, where you're using atrazine programs, over time what happens is uh, we, we see a selection for a microbial community that targets atrazine and breaks down atrazine quickly. So it's called enhanced microbial degradation. Um, and so this work uh, that was published just a few years ago where it included five sites throughout Pennsylvania um, 
in, in locations where there was a, a history of atrazine use, um, the, the half-life of atrazine was less than five days. And so typically, if you would look that up in a book value, it would say atrazine's um, half-life is, is closer to 40 or 60 days. Um, so really the reason, you know, the reason why we're still including atrazine in these programs is it's a great synergist for HPPD uh, products. Um, so we're not, we're not advocating or recommending pulling atrazine out of uh, corn programs because it adds activity and lengthens the, the, the weed control spectrum when it's used with HPPD inhibiting herbicides. Okay, so that, that brings us to those HPPDs again. So these are, these are commonly used uh, residuals in corn programs. I'm including uh, a couple here that are more typically used as pre's, so balance or corvus uh, programs. Callisto can be used as a pre or post. Uh, so that's an active ingredient that's in programs like Lumax, Lexar, Acuron products. Uh, and then I'm also including these um, post-emergence HPPDs that we're seeing uh, more use of, Impact and Lotus. Uh, and those are post products, but all, they also have some residual activity. Um, and so in general, um, we think that there's, there's fairly limited potential for these HPPD products to, to kind of produce carryover injury to winter cereals. Uh, there's a much higher potential for carryover injury to legumes and brassicas, and probably specifically smaller seeded legumes or brassicas. Um, if you're, um, you know, you're, you're probably, you know, the data suggests that balance or isoxyflutol um, products are going to last uh, a little bit longer than Callisto. Um, and so, you know, if you had to choose one, Callisto is probably going to um, uh, um, have, have less likelihood of carryover issues. Um, but again, these are, these are products with Callisto and these post-emergence HPPDs that can be used post-emergence. And some, some, some growers are using them as a pre and a post. And so when we're using uh, higher levels of active ingredients in your programs, that's also gonna raise the likelihood of, of having some carryover issues. Okay, so, um, uh, just a, a few more notes on those post HPPDs. I, I wanted to share this because this is uh, we had a field trial out this um, this past summer that that looked at some of these issues, and this was actually in sweet corn, and we were looking at uh, these post HPPD products. So Callisto, with or without atrazine, Impact and Lotus, and another newly uh, labeled HPPD inhibitor, ShieldX uh, tolpyrolate is the is the active ingredient there. Um, and so we were applying these post-emergence and sweet corn, and then we came back and seeded three cover crops uh, about nine weeks after application. Um, so um, about, yeah, nine weeks. And then um, we seeded cereal rye, forage radish, and crimson clover. And so this is just one year of data, but um, we're applying these, or we're seeding these cover crops, you know, two months after applying these products, and we didn't really see any injury uh, and could safely intercede cereal, or not intercede, but post-harvest seed cereal rye or forage radish. Uh, we really couldn't, couldn't detect any, any injury. We did, however, see some injury to crimson clover, and we saw some differences uh, between those HPPDs. We saw higher levels of injury uh, with impact in comparison to those other products. Um, so that's probably, you know, um, a similar scenario perhaps um, that might apply to corn silage where we might be able to get a mixture like this out. Um, and so it suggests that certainly cereal rye and, and forage radish looks like we, we, you know, under normal conditions, we'd be able to get away with that. Okay, so um, a, a few other modes of action I just wanted to touch on. So maybe using uh, group two or ALS inhibitors in your corn programs. Um, we're using a lot of peak uh, or recommending peak for burr cucumber control these days uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, accent, resolve, permit, um, these are going to be uh, used for particular weed species problems. Um, and so a few notes about these ALS inhibitors. Uh, this is one mode of action where pH uh, makes a difference. So we see more persistence 
or greater persistence in high pH soils. Um, and so what I mean by high pH is probably great, greater than seven, um, but really pretty limited risk uh, as far as um, being able to post-harvest seed winter cereals with these products. Um, and, and some risk um, uh, as far as carryover injury to legumes or brassicas. So uh, a lot of group twos are used in soybean as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, probably the most common ones would be Pursuit, uh, Classic or First Rate. If you don't have ALS resistant mare's tail, you might be using those products, uh, Harmony. Um, and so again, pretty limited risk of carryover to winter cereals. However, the one that you should recognize and be cautious with would be Pursuit, uh, has a pretty long half-life, uh, is active on some grasses and um, some Midwest data suggests that carryover injury to annual ryegrass can occur. And then also um, pretty high risk uh, to carryover injury to brassica cover crops. So brassicas are pretty sensitive uh, to Pursuit. Okay, last, um, last mode of action that's um, being used as resi for, for residual use in, in um, soybeans would be the PPOs. Very important um, uh, site of action or mode of action uh, these days in soybean programs. And so here we have uh, probably the most common uh, PPO inhibitors would be authority programs. Uh, so that the active ingredient there is sulfentrazone. Um, and then Valor is also a common um, pre-residual uh, in soybeans. Uh, Reflex, um, however, is, a, is really a post, a good post product, PPO product, that has a pretty long half-life and soil residual activity. And so that's the one that often gets producers uh, because they're using it post-emergence, it has foliar activity, but they don't realize the length of residual activity it does have. Uh, and it and can definitely cause some, some carryover injury um, in those types of circumstances. The last one there, Sharpen, is really just a burn down, uh, short-lived, um, no worries as far as carryover potential for, for post-harvest seedings. Okay, uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is just maybe just a little uh, important sidebar here is that what we see a lot of uh, these days is dual purpose cover crops, particularly in our dairy systems uh, where, where, where growers are growing corn silage and then they're, um, they're, they're planting a cover crop, typically a winter cereal. Um, they may plan to take that as forage in the spring or they may take it for forage in the spring if it's a good stand or burn it down if it's not. Um, and so if that is in the plans to be taking that cover crop as a forage, then a particular uh, attention needs to be paid to rotation intervals. Uh, and so rotation interval, um, just as a, as a reminder, is the time between application and planting of a falling cover crop. You're gonna find a rotation interval table likely or a paragraph in all herbicide labels. Um, and what they're really designed to do are, are really two things, and, and probably foremost, what they do is uh, designed to protect human animals from herbicide residues. Um, and secondly, uh, to ensure establishment of the following crop by limiting the potential for this carryover injury. So it's not just about the potential for carryover injury, it's also about um, limiting, limiting uh, herbicide residues. Um, and so, the rules are if you're gonna um, if you're just gonna be using the cover crop as a as a green manure and you're gonna burn it down, um, you can go ahead and use any residual product you want. You of course um, you know are gonna incur the cost of of injury if it occurs. Um, and but if you are gonna use it as a forage, then the rotation restrictions really have to be followed to stay on label. Um, and so a lot of cover crops don't appear in the rotation interval. Um, and so if they don't appear in the rotation table, uh, you have to use the most restrictive rotation interval. Uh, and so that can be problematic for certain products. 
Um, and so if you're using a mixture and, and say rye is in the rotation uh, table, but you're using another cover crop that's not, you have to go with the most restrictive rotation interval to stay on label. And so that's, um, in, in most cases, that's not too big of an issue. Um, Ciro rye, uh, it, there's often information about uh, Ciro rye in the rotation intervals. Um, and, and of course, winter wheat, if you're using that as your uh, double crop forage. Uh, but there are a few products where the rotation interval to cereal rye or winter wheat is greater than four and a half months. Um, and so a, a few of those um, that I mentioned earlier, would in, that would include a couple of these group 15 uh, herbicides, Zidua and Harness products. Um, Interestingly enough, if you if you're just uh, using Atrex, so just the uh, just uh, atrazine alone, um, it it has a rotation interval that's greater than four and a half months. But a lot of these premixed products that include atrazine um, uh, do have a four and a half month rotation interval. And then the other big ones would be these Valor and Spartan, or I should have said authority there because they're common uh, residual products used in soybeans at planting. Um, and so if you're thinking about trying to get a, get a cover crop of um, cereal um, rye established after soybeans, um, in order to take that for a forage, you might run into trouble. Okay, so um, a couple other things. So we've been doing some work um, thinking uh, about these burn down scenarios um, in no-till systems, um, either after a small grain um, or in corn silage where we have an opportunity to establish something other than a winter cereal where we can establish mixtures, including some of these legumes and brassica cover crops. Um, and so, uh, you know, often what we might do there is just a glyphosate application or maybe we're including 2,4-D to broaden the weed control spectrum. Um, and so this becomes problematic when we have mare's tail in our system. So we need to be able to control mare's tail prior to seeding these, these cover crops. Um, and so, so that's a, a particular problem. And then also we know that 2,4-D and dicamba have a little bit of residual activity. Um, and so um, there's really not a lot of good information on how long you really need to wait after applying 2,4-D or dicamba to be able to safely come back and seed some of these legume or brassica cover crops. And so uh, Dwight Lingenfelter and, and myself had a trial out this past year where we um, set up worst case scenarios where we came in in early September um, and we came into a tilled seed bed and we applied different burn down products um, and then we, we made sure that they got activated. So we um, irrigated right after applying or a day after applying. And then we came back and we seeded cover crops the day of or seven or 14 days after we applied these burn down products. And so our first year data was, um, was pretty good. We're gonna replicate this, but it, it highlighted some likely um, issues that, you would, that would you, you would come across in this type of scenario. Um, so what we found was, um, you know, certainly with dicamba and 2,4-D, there's a potential for, for injury. Um, the potential is greater, closer at when you, when you're seeding closer to, um, application. All right. So when, when we were out 14 days after application, we were able to, to get annual ryegrass and cereal rye established without much injury. Um, that was not the case for forage radish. We saw high levels of injury with 2,4-D um, or dicamba, less with dicamba. We know dicamba is, is um, you know, less active on brassicas in comparison to 2,4-D. But the big takeaway here is that we had really good safety, even, um, even seeding right after application with Sharpen and Liberty for the grass species. And that's important because these products are, have good activity on mare's tail. Um, and so we should be able to get good weed control and still be able to safely uh, plant a cover crop. And so we're gonna repeat this, but uh, that certainly looks um, like what's going on. Uh, legumes, however, are, are a different story. Um, 
certainly we saw really high levels of, of um, injury uh, to alfalfa, crimson clover, and red clover after applying 2,4-D or dicamba. We still saw fairly high levels um, after waiting 14 days prior to seeding. Um, but ag again, we saw very limited injury to these legumes uh, after applying Sharpen or Liberty. So the, the take home really here is if, if you need to add something to the tank to glyphosate in these burn down scenarios, and you really wanna take advantage of those growing degree days and get something seeded uh, quickly, that um, Sharpen and Liberty may be good uh, tank, tank mix partner, partners that provide some additional uh, activity, particularly for Mare's Hill. Okay, last, um, last thing I wanted to just touch on. Um, so another kind of um, you know, thing that we, I think is probably more common in New York, but we see some of, of this in, in Pennsylvania as well, is frost seeding a cover crop into a winter grain, uh, winter wheat or, or another winter grain. Um, and so there's some issues there uh, in that, with that relay cropping practice as far as uh, the potential for some herbicide carryover injury to, to frost seeded legumes. Um, and so the considerations here are really, what is the weed control spectrum? So a lot of times we can get away with fairly simple uh, herbicide programs in our winter grains, um, but we have ALS resistant chickweed, we have mare's tail issues, uh, we might be controlling perennials um, uh, in the fall or the spring uh, in winter grains. And so the weed press pressure is gonna dictate kind of the herbicide options and, and the need for these, these products, but also your application window, right? So whether you're able to get, get out uh, after seeding in the fall uh, and, and get some weed control programs out, or if uh, your weed control programs are really pushed into that spring green up period. So we don't have a lot of data on that, but um, a colleague, uh, Christy Sprague at Michigan State does. Um, she did a couple of years of field trials looking at the scenario with common uh, wheat um, products. Um, so these are products that are, you know, can either be applied in the fall or the spring. Um, and, and they're gonna vary in the level of kind of residual activity and weed, con and weed control spectrum they have. Um, but what Christy found in her work was um, you know, some of the more common products that we might use um, um, in, in this system. So Harmony Extra is one that's often used, um, you know, 2,4-D or, or, or Clarity. Um, we uh, might be able to get away with using those in the fall uh, with limited potential for carryover injury to a frost heated um, legume in the spring. Um, but we really can't, we really can't be using these herbicide products, even if they have um, really limited residual activity um, in the spring and be able to frost seed. Um, and so that's kind of the takeaway from her, from her work um, that I wanted to share with you. Okay, so just to summarize all that, um, I know that was a lot of information I should have um, highlighted. We have uh, tables in our weed guide which we have um, coming out, the 2021 guide, the Mid-Atlantic Weed Control Guide. Um, we have information about kind of the relative ranking of, of um, carryover potential with some of these products for both corn and soybean uh, herbicide programs. And you can find the information there. Um, but, but in general, um, as far as winter cereals go, um, really under normal environmental conditions, uh, and we're using these pre-products at the right rate, applying them at the right time, we're typically gonna come away uh, and, and be able to safely seed winter cereals post-harvest. Um, in, those, in those double cropping systems um, where we're thinking about that winter cereal as a forage, uh, we need to make sure that we understand the rotational restrictions to be able to stay on label. When we're adding uh, diversity uh, and, and trying to uh, establish cover crop mixtures. Um, certainly some of these longer lived residual programs that we use both in corn and soybeans, uh, there would be some potential for carryover injury with, with smaller seeded legumes and brassicas. 
there, I would suggest that if you can afford it, as far as weed control, that um, moving to some shorter lived uh, setup programs and good post programs um, is a good way to ensure safety when, when you're coming back uh, and seeing those types of cover crops. That if, that's if you can get the weed control you need. Um, and then finally, what we're finding out is as far as making sure that you can get in and seed quickly post harvest and, and you need to come in and start clean with some burn down products, um, exercise caution with 2,4-D or dicamba. Um, so there is some potential for, for injury unless you wait probably 14 days or so. Uh, and there we have, we, it does seem like we have a few products uh, that can broaden weed control spectrum like Sharpen uh, or Liberty products. So I think I did that in plenty of time. Um, and should have some time for questions, Jeff, or we can turn it over to you. Yeah, so uh, thanks, John, for a very informative talk. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to ask people if they have questions to enter them into the chat box, if they will, and then we'll definitely uh, announce them to John and let him respond. I do have a question for you, John. Um, there's definitely more interest in cover crops these days, and I, I, I know it's still a limited marketplace for many companies, but there's definitely uh, some growers that are doing the triticale after corn silage harvest as well. Um, do you think that companies will invest time and effort into doing the research to see what the uh, outcome is and the safety of feeding those forages after uh, their lineup of products? That's a great uh, question, Jeff. I think, I think, um... I think the biggest question is whether those those residue tests were actually done. Um, so in, in conversations with some industry partners around the region, when, when I've asked them about this, um, you know, what ends up on the label doesn't necessarily mean uh, is not everything that was done um, in the run up to getting that uh, label approved. And so there may be, you know, residue tests for some of these, um, you know, winter cereals uh, that they could go back to without a significant cost or investment and, and, and get that label updated. If they have to go back and do the residue testing, I think we probably, dairy states need to um, make the case that this is, you know, important um, for, for them to invest in. And I, I think we should do that. Because I think um, I think uh, we're we're just seeing more and more of this double crop system in Pennsylvania. Um, so yeah, but it's that's that's a great question, um, and uh, but I, I don't have a better answer than that. So John Kitty has a question too. I'm going to let her uh, voice that to you now. Yeah, hi, John. I was just hey, if you, you could clarify the risk to frost seeded clover. Um, is this from herbicides applied in the previous fall or in the previous spring? I missed that little detail. No, so this, this, this would be this would be um, uh, in season. So if you're applying, if you're spinning on um, red clover into wheat, um, you know, at the end of winter, just before spring green up, um, she was looking at fall applied products. And then I guess I'm not sure exactly what, what the timing was with the spring, um, spring applied products, how, how close that was to frost seeding. I mean, I, I guess really they would need to go out. She must've been broadcasting later in the spring um, if she's applying those, those products in the spring as well. Thank you. And I have a, an additional question. So I looked at your figure for authority and I think it was 30 to 300 days. Can you explain why there's such a big range for the rigid, residual activity? Yeah. Um, well, so I think that's, so a lot of that work is, it, they just do it across different um, soil textures and, 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 um, and like, pHs and so that's sometimes why you, why you get the range um, and so um, you know 
sulfentrazone is um, it, like in comparison to Valor is, is more water soluble than Valor. Um, but so I think it's mostly related to it's it how um, how soil texture and pH change its absorption capacity in the soil. Um, and so I guess I'd have to go back and look at um, you know uh, it's probably light light soils, sandy soils versus clay soils. And so there's probably it's probably those heavy soils where we're seeing that longer residual activity or, or longer half-life with sulfenture zone. Well, John, I thank you very much for being with us today and uh, providing such great information. I'm going to turn it over to Kitty now. Thanks, Jeff. Um, if there's no more questions for John, I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mike Hunter. He is my teammate on Cornell Cooperative Extension's North Country Regional Ag Team up here in the North Country. He's a field crop specialist. He has been up here serving uh, farms and ag businesses in Northern New York for over 22 years. And before that, he put in a few years um, in agribusiness. He's had a commercial pesticide license in, uh, since 1989, and he's been a CCA for almost that long, for 26 years. He specializes in row crop weed and pest control, especially corn and soybeans. He's also be been one of our most important um, voices, uh, keeping us tuned into herbicide resistance management uh, in the last several years. And he promotes the IPM practices um, that we like combining cultural, mechanical, and chemical um, controls. And he, in fact, was recognized by New York State IPM program for his expertise and efforts in 2019 with their excellence in IPM award. So today, he's going to offer some guidance, some ideas on managing the other end of the cover crops, uh, the termination point. Take it away, Mike. Okay, thank you, Kitty. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Somehow, I don't have my mouse, but I'm okay with it. I think we can do this. So anyway, so thank you. Thanks everybody for joining today. Um, so it's gonna be interesting. I mean, John spent the first uh, part of the program today talking about how not to kill cover crops. And I'm gonna wrap up with how to kill cover crops. So we're gonna talk about terminating cover crops. And that's one of the big things is uh, growers um, approach me and ask me about you know planting cover crops. You know, a, a new person that wants to um, plant cover crops, they, they ask about it, you know, should they do it? And then, you know, we talk about all the benefits of planting cover crops, but the one question that they have to ask themselves um, before they plant any cover crop is, what is your termination strategy going to be? And so what I mean by that is, is at the end of the time frame of the cover crop that you want that's in the field, how are you going to kill that? So we have to talk about managing cover crop growth and how you're going to do it. So there's a few different ways we can do this um, or approach that. Uh, the, uh, we could look at winter kill. We could look at mechanical, which would involve tillage, mowing, roller crimpers. And then we could go to an herbicide as an option as well. So if we look at winter kill options, we can look at uh, using winter kill um, with a lot of our summer annual cover crops that we use. Oats would be an example, tillage radish, um, the turnips, the forage brassicas, and then buckwheat maybe. Um, you know, a little bit of that's used for cover crops, uh, summer annual cover crops. So we would use those. Uh, they work out really well. Oats is a great way to, uh, uh, to put on a cover crop late summer, um, early fall. You could put down, uh, plant oats. You give yourself the, the cover crop, a lot of the cover crop benefits that you may get with cereal rye or triticale, but the benefit with the oats would be we don't have to deal with trying to kill that in the springtime or terminate that stand if it were like the, the rye or the triticale that we oftentimes have to deal with. We look at mechanical uh, means of doing it. Mechanical would be tillage. And a lot of times we're seeing less and less tillage being used. So tillage isn't always the first thing that people want to do because, you know, we plant cover crops and a lot of these cover crops go in reduced tillage, minimum tillage situations. They go into no-till situations. And so when we talk to growers about, well, let's kill this stand of 
clover or ryegrass or cereal rye with tillage, not usually high up on their list. Um, and if we were to do that, if we do resort to tillage, we're looking a lot of times at pretty intensive tillage to get a good kill on that. Um, we would be looking at mold bore plowing, chisel plowing, um, because our vertical tillage units um, and reduced tillage sometimes wouldn't be an effective enough method to, uh, to terminate those stands, some of these cover crop stands. Another mechanical means of terminating a cover crop would be mowing. And as John mentioned um, earlier, that uh, we have a lot of dairies that are using, you know, rye. Triticale is really popular to use, uh, winter triticale. They harvest that um, in the springtime for forage, a high quality dairy forage. Um, so mowing is an effective way to, um, to terminate a, uh, the cover crop stand by, by doing that. And then another method would be the roller crimper. And there's a couple of um, examples on this slide here. Um, the one on the left is from a, an organic dairy um, here in the North Country that, uh, that purchased this roller crimper in the springtime. And they were going to uh, roll their cereal rye crop and then no-till soybeans into that. And then the other picture is uh, a setup on a corn planter where it's rolled ahead of, um, on a toolbar ahead of the corn planter. And then we look at uh, herbicides as a possibility. Um, and that's probably our more common way that we're using to terminate um, cover crops. And it's the use of an herbicide, a burn down herbicide. Um, and there's multiple different ones that we can look at. Um, so these are just some pictures of a trial that we had here in the North Country um, in 2021. This is a resistant uh, mare's tail soybean herbicide trial. And in this one on the left hand side, this was nine inch tall cereal rye that was treated uh, with a glyphosate application on May 14th. Um, this photo was taken uh, May 20th and you can see how the how quickly the glyphosate started to to uh, to act. You can see that yellow block in there that we sprayed and then uh, this field was planted the next day to soybeans into that. So it was seven days after application of the glyphosate, they planted the soybeans and then the picture on the right is that same um, same trial. Um, <clears throat> so we look at uh, planting green. Planting green is one of these we can ask, uh, uh, you know, a million agronomists, a million farmers, and you're going to get a million different answers about planting green. Is, is this something that we should do? Is it something we shouldn't do? And when we say planting green, it means, uh, you know, taking these, uh, these cover crops in the springtime, uh, you know, a cereal, uh, cereal grain crop, uh, triticale or rye, um, you know, and or uh, annual ryegrass maybe, and uh, going right into there and no-tilling into that uh, green stand before it's terminated uh, with the idea that we're going to plant into that green and then we're going to come back in and we're going to terminate that stand um, after planting. Um, so there's a lot of risk that we have to it. And I'm on the side of the fence that I think it's, you know, it's way too risky. Um, and so waiting to terminate <clears throat> um, after planting is, is again, you know, just a challenge. So, you know, if it's, if it's me, I want to, I'm going to be more conservative and I'm going to be ready to terminate that stand as, as early as I can in the springtime, because again, our, our weather patterns can be so variable and it can really kick us out of the field and, and delay those applications. Um, you know, these pictures here were taken in 2017 with a, a farm we were working with up in St. Lawrence County. Uh, they planted the whole farm to, uh, to cereal rye. Uh, in the springtime, it was, uh, these were a little bit heavier soils um, that were, that they planted on. Um, didn't have an opportunity to get the, um, you know, the sprayer in to, to terminate that stand ahead of time. And, you know, then it got late. Uh, again, the ground was uh, fairly wet, tough to traffic. And uh, then the rye started to head out by the time the um, applicator was able to go in there. So they were trying to terminate um, a pretty tall rye crop. And so this was taken not too long after the, the glyphosate application in this situation. And uh, um, it also had a residual herbicide in there as well in the tank mix, which also posed a little bit of a problem because you're trying to put this residual herbicide in with a tank mix. Um, and then it's relying on trying to get those residual herbicides down to the soil. We have so much plant residue there that, uh, you know, that was you know, intercepting that um, before it hit the soil surface. So that was a tough prom problem as well to deal with. And then they went in with a planter. And, and again, this was totally not the plan in the beginning of the season, uh, but this is what they resorted to. Um, and again, it's, it's just, just a lot of risk there. So I'd, I'd like to say, 
let's see if we can get that uh, that rye terminated as quick as we can um, before, or if it's ryegrass, the same thing, because we can give you more and more stories all day. We could spend all afternoon talking about, you know, the, the challenges and failures we've had with people that have have waited, they've planted green and, and just a lot of other ones. Um, the other stories we could talk about, we could go into the seed corn maggot issue. We could go into the army worm issues that it poses on the entomology side of it too. So, so again, planting, um, planting green is, is, is extremely risky to do. And I think there's a lot more risk to it than there is rewards. Um, so I'd like to see it, you know, sprayed and killed ahead of time um, to try to head off some of those challenges. So when um, selecting herbicides for termination, so we want to look at a few different things um, before we make that selection of what we're going to use. So we start out with the cover crop species. Um, what are we um, planting? Uh, the growth stage. The growth stage is going to be really important for um, a lot of these cover crops that are being used. So, you know, the growth stage um, with the cover crops will be similar to um, our weeds. You know, when we try to do uh, control weeds post-emergence. You know, we're going to try to catch them when they're early stage of growth, smaller. Same could be said here um, when we're using herbicides um, to control these cover crops is we want to catch them when they're smaller um, because when they get taller, it's a little bit uh, tougher to, to, to kill those. Sometimes we need to have higher rates. Sometimes we need to totally change our strategy, our chemical strategy as to what we're going to use because of the stage of growth. Um, the other thing that we need to talk about is uh, the weeds present at time of application as well. So when we go to terminate those cover crops, look at the weeds present. So see what's out there. And John mentioned it earlier and he highlighted it a number of times and said it, um, you know, the big one seems to be in, in, a, in a cover crop situation at the timing of cover crop, it's going to be um, the resistant weeds that we're going to be looking at. And primarily it's going to be the resistant mare's tail, either ALS um, or glyphosate resistant mare's tail. Uh, the other thing that we look at is crop to be planted. So, um, you know, what's going to be the subsequent crop. And John mentioned a lot of that, um, you know, and talked about the, you know, the planting restrictions before we plant any of these crops. And he was talking about cover crops, but the same could be said for trying to plant corn or going to soybeans. And so we have to look at that, the weather conditions at application, and then also the type of the herbicide used. So the cover crop species, these are going to be the common ones that you're going to see the grasses, which would be cereal rye, oats, rye grass, our broadleaf cover crop species would be clover, tillage, radish, turnips. And then sometimes we can get a combination of both where we get those cocktail mixes of a lot of different uh, seeds, um, cover crop seeds planted. So you could see um, there's a number of farms that are using a combination of red clover and annual ryegrass. So you're getting a grass species and a broadleaf species um, in the same mix. And those can overwinter. So um, the weeds present, um, I mentioned that. Uh, you know, we have to really examine what's out there for weeds present um, at the time of termination and does it require something else to go in the tank mix, um, you know, with our with our burn down that we would be using to kill the um, cover crop. So this is an example of uh, the of the resistant mare's tail um, or horseweed that we're talking about. Um, we also look at the crop to be planted. And again, John mentioned a lot of these planting restrictions and we need to really be mindful of following the label really closely to, you know, what are our restrictions when we go into planting um, soybeans, um, in particular corn somewhat, but mostly the soybeans are gonna be the ones that are gonna be the most restrictive with a lot of the products we use. So we wanna pay attention to that. Um, the one thing we wanna look at would be um, 2,4-D ester, for example, um, we're gonna see in the springtime for cover crop termination, uh, common common um, programs will be used to glyphosate. Um, we could put the 2,4-D ester in there. Um, you could also have some others, you know, other people would use 2,4-D amine. You could use dicamba in that same thing if we wanted to use glyphosate plus something to control maybe the overwintering mare's tail that may be out there in that, uh, in that same cover crop field. Um, I choose the 2,4-D ester. We wanna look at the 2,4-D ester and I like to try to keep the rate as low as I can to that pint rate, because if we keep the 2,4-D ester rate to a pint uh, based on a four pound gallon formulation, it allows us only a seven day um, wait time before we um, plant the soybeans. Okay, we go into two pints and then it, it extends that. And, and if we're using the, two, the amine formulation or our dicamba, it could be much longer than that for soybeans. So again, I don't like to use the amines or the dicambas in the springtime 
because of the sensitivity to uh, to our plant window that we have for soybeans. If we're in this in a in an area that has a lot longer growing season and could afford the time to wait that 14 days, sometimes 28 days from time of of application to planting, that would be fine. But you know, it's tough when we you know when we have that uh, those small windows that we try to get stuff planted when the soils are ready to go. It's hard to sit back and wait and say, well, geez, I still got to wait another week um, on top of, of this. So, so we have that to think about. Sharpen is another one to think or consider. Sharpen, again, I like to use that. You can use a higher rate um, in the burn down in the springtime, but if we keep that rate to an ounce rate, there's not going to be any planting restrictions for soybeans. Um, the same would be said for corn. The other thing that we have seen, um, and it's it's happened a few times that uh, you know that I've that I've encountered, is you know a grower goes into the season, kills terminates a, a cover crop with say glyphosate has 2,4-D in it, and decides that oh no instead of planting soybeans or corn I want to plant soybeans in that field. Well, if they use 2,4-D amine at a high rate or a dicamba with that glyphosate then soybeans are off the table and you can't make that uh, quick decision and change, change gears that, that quick. Same thing with sharpen. If all of a sudden that, that rate was up to the two ounce rate and they were anticipating planting corn and then all of a sudden said, no, I want to plant soybeans, that two ounce rate, we can't do that. Um, so we'd have too big of a wait time there as well. So, so it throws on those added restrictions. So pay really close attention to that. And then we look at our type of herbicides that, that we use, um, contact herbicides. Um, they have some advantages and disadvantages. The advantages would be cooler temperatures, um, don't seem to limit the activity as much. The disadvantage would be the coverage in gallons per acre. So coverage would be, you know, our spray coverage, we're going to want to use, um, you know, a, a medium spray, spray droplet size, gallons per acre. Our carrier is going to have to be pretty heavy, 15 to 20 gallons uh, minimum. You know, we get into some heavier cover crop situations and it wouldn't be uncommon to see some of those um, asked to be going up to 25 and in some cases maybe as high as 30 gallons of, of water per acre. So that throws off field efficiency there. So our contact herbicides that we'd be looking at would be um, that we're speaking of some of those would be uh, primarily the paraquat or the Camoxone, um, Liberty as well. But we don't see Liberty used as much in the springtime for a, for a burn down, but we could. Um, that's the glufosinate. And then our translocated herbicides, the advantages would be complete coverage is not needed as much. So we can keep our, our um, gallons per acre down lower. So it helps with field efficiency. So we could be down to rates as low as if it was glyphosate, we could be down to 10 gallons to the acre um, to 15 in that, that range um, using those um, other translocated herbicides that we would be familiar with or using would be our, our synthetic auxins, which would be our dicambas, our 2,4-Ds, and chlorpyrrolid, which is stinger. Um, disadvantages with some of our translocated herbicides would be some of our slower uptake in cooler temperatures, and we certainly have those here in the North Country in the springtime when we're trying to make some of these um, applications on these cover crops. So again, our non-selective herbicides are going to be our popular ones that are going to be used and, and the most widely used one would be the glyphosate followed by paraquat or gamoxone and then glufosinate. Our non, our, those are our non-selective herbicides. And then our selective herbicides that we would be using would be our broadleaf ones, which would be the dicambas and 2,4-Ds that I'd mentioned. And then in some cases, we'll get into some of these grass herbicides like uh, these selective grass herbicides like cithoxidum or clethidum. Um, so that would be post and select. Um, so rye cover crop termination. So if we're going to try to terminate a rye cover crop, if it were no-till corn and soybeans, um, glyphosate is going to be, be the preferred product of choice for burning down the cereal rye. And then gramoxone um, can also be effective, but timing is going to be more important. So um, here's some work um, that uh, John's probably well familiar with down at Penn State. Uh, this is work that was done in Landisville in 2009. Um, it was applied... Uh, it was cereal rye. They applied it April 13th, and it was rated on June 3rd. The rye was 8 to 10 inches tall at time of application. And you can see um, the, the excellent control that they got with uh, the Roundup original max rate of 22 ounces and touchdown total also excellent uh, um, control there at 97%. Um, and then the um, using Paraquat, when they used Paraquat or the Gramoxone alone at three pints, they we're only able to achieve 70% control of the um, rye. And that was only cereal rye at eight to 10 inches tall, which doesn't seem extremely tall. We've seen 
a lot of times we'll drive around and, and visit fields that, that people are trying to kill rye at a lot taller than that, even in the springtime, especially those wet seasons. Um, so the other thing they did too um, in this trial was they added uh, um, atrazine um, with, with the Paraquat um, and the addition of the atrazine. Um, any of the photosystem two um, herbicides mixed with gramoxone, um, be it atrazine or metribuzin, um, seems to really increase the activity on the gramoxone, of the gramoxone on the cereal rye. So you could see that uh, brought it right back up, um, similar to the, uh, to the, to the glyphosate um, uh, ratings. So factors for effective cover crop control for the herbicide, it's going to be herbicide rate. Um, so the, the glyphosate rate is going to depend on the stage of growth. So as the cover crops are smaller, we can get away with lower rates. As the cover crops get taller, we're going to have to increase those glyphosate rates. So we have to pay attention to that. Um, you know, if it was rye, um, the chromoxone, better on the smaller rye. But, you know, you know, before it gets to that boot stage, once it gets to the boot stage, chromoxone is going to be really difficult um, or have a difficult time controlling cereal rye. Um, air temperature, we mentioned that. The cool nights, we don't want that. Uh, those cold nights down below 40 degrees is going to reduce activity, um, especially when our days, um, you know, don't, uh, don't break those 55 degree days. Um, after application. Ryegrass cover crop termination. This is a tough one. So ryegrass can be a booger to control. Um, this is some, um, some information from University of Illinois suggesting that controlling it before it is eight inches tall is going to be ideal. It needs to be actively growing. And then the glyphosate rates are quite high. They're suggesting uh, 1.25 acid equivalent, um, pounds of acid equivalent per acre, and even two and a half pounds acid equivalent per acre is better. Um, with the addition actually of adding sharpen to that to improve control. Um, and as you know, as I said that I should have mentioned it a little bit earlier that um, again, I, th I think we're in a situation with, um, you know, we, we just have too many situations here where, where, you know, we have to be very mindful of, you know, tank mixing things with glyphosate. I don't think we should be using glyphosate by itself um, alone without something else in a tank mix you know, for the control of some of these, um, these weeds that we're, we're dealing with these glyphosate, glyphosate resistant weeds that we're dealing with, um, you know, mare's tail would be the first one that comes to mind. And then, you know, we get into, you know, they don't come, you don't see them in cover crops as much at termination. Um, we wouldn't see the palmer or the tall water hemp then that's more of an in-crop um, situation. But again, we just don't want to be using glyphosate, um, you know, by itself. And that's where the glyphosate and, and a 2,4-D ester or a glyphosate and sharpen, you know, really helps because again, it's a different, uh, different site of action and also effective on those, um, you know, those broadleaf weeds, you know, that we're looking at. Um, tank mixing atrazine or metribuzin with glyphosate, we have to, um, be careful because there can be some antagonism with that and it reduces control on the flip side using chromoxone um, with a metribuzin or atrazine actually increases the control. And uh, again, I'd mentioned the, the temperature um, sensitivities that we have with, with glyphosate. Um, red clover, cover crop termination. So if we're gonna terminate uh, red clover, be it in the fall, we have to watch it in the fall for it, depending on what we're going to plant after that, if we, after we terminate it, um, if we're going to be using some of these dicambas or, um, or the two, four Ds, but if we're not going to plant anything in the fall, um, dicamba would be, uh, would be the first choice that I would go with, um, in the fall to terminate red clover. Um, if I was not going to be using tillage, um, you could use a pint or a half a pint to a pint. Um, you could also consider the two, four D esters and then, you know, those would be the selective, you know, so they're selective herbicides. So that's going to leave some of our grasses out there. Um, so if you wanted to try to pick up some of those other weeds for more of a complete burn down, you know, we could still use the glyphosate, you know, in that tank mix, um, include it with some 2,4-D ester um, and or another um, suggestion would be the glyphosate sharpen rates again. Um, you know, they would be, uh, you know, really good pro programs um, for the red clover cover crop termination. Sharpen alone, um, wouldn't be a choice that we would use, but if you mix it with glyphosate, it's certainly going to help it because um, glyphosate alone on red clover would be a little bit tougher. So that needs a little help. And so that's why we're putting in the 2,4-D ester or the sharpen with it. And uh, so that's what I have. I've gone plenty of time into my, my allotment there. I want to make sure that we've left time for some questions. So I'm going to skip through these last three that's uh, 
it's that's what I have. I can open it up to questions. So, Mike, uh, I, I do have a question for you. This is Jeff Miller. Uh, uh, folks in this area that grow wheat, uh, do the frost crack red clover into wheat, and some of them have pretty decent stands uh, by fall. It definitely is scary to them, and they definitely pull the plug, and, and most of them kill the red clover in the fall mm -hmm. because of the fear of having problems in the spring. Would you have yeah. any suggestions for materials to use for spring termination? Yeah, uh, well, it depends, I guess, on what you're going to plant. So what would they follow it with? That would be going into corn, wouldn't it be, Jeff? Correct. Yeah, so if it's going into corn, you could do a few things with it. You could look at, um, you know, corn's going to afford us the opportunity to use a dicamba ahead of time. Um, also going to be um, able to use um, Stinger's, a really good um, product. We use Stinger a lot on terminating um, Roundup, uh, Roundup Ready alfalfa stands, so chlorpyrrolid. And so clear clopyrrolids used in, in some of our premixes, our corn herbicide premixes that we could use. So they would be looking at, uh, you know, say maybe, a, you know, a Resicor, um, you know, a Sure Start, uh, one of those. Um, we look at uh, uh, Hornet has, has Stinger in it as well. Um, you could also use just a, a dicamba with some of our, um, some of our other, um, dicamba with some of our other, uh, you know, just an atrazine plus a group 15. So we could be looking at, uh, at a dual, um, you know, a harness or an outlook with atrazine. Um, you could use, you know, you could always add Banville to those or, or dicamba to that as well. Um, and so then that would be one, you could also use, um, you know, include, you know, roundup with those as well, if it's going to be, a you know, you know, burn down at, at time of planting, um, or before, um, so those will be some, some suggestions that I would have, um, is using, you know, one of those, um, group four herbicides with it, um, you know, with our, you know, with an atrazine glyphosate, um, plus, uh, you know, plus, uh, you know, you know, if you, if you want a more of a complete herbicide, you know, put the grass or herbicide in there too, you know, one of the, um, one of the group 15s as well. Um, so. And I'm not sure that everybody viewed this, but uh, one of the growers had a question related to if rye is, is, it, is in the field as a cover crop and it's getting late, is it uh, possible to mow it and then basically treat it within, let's say, a corn production system? And Kitty responded that, you know, if those plants are near flower stage, then yes, you're going to kill that plant uh, right. at that time. And, mm -hmm. you know, those folks that have messed around with crimping, it's mm -hmm. kind of the same thing. The later that you wait, if you can wait to milk mm -hmm. stage, you're much more likely to kill the plants by crimping sure. them. Sure. Yeah. Pollination. I mean, that's when the roller crimper works the best. When you have the yellow, you know, the yellow dust is flying through the field as you're going through with a crimper, that's going to be the more successful way to, to uh, you know, to have the crimper work that, you know, from the experiences that I've seen with the roller crimpers. Um, and the, go ahead. And Sean Bozzard uh, mm -hmm. from SUNY Morrisville has mm -hmm. one of those devices that you showed where you have the, kind of like the crimpers between the corn units at planting. Yeah, that was a picture I took when I was looking at Sean's planting. At okay. I should have told you that. So, yeah, so I should, I'll give, I took the picture, but I'll give Sean credit for setting it up. So, yeah, no, but, it is. But he's been pretty successful. He's got, mm -hmm. you know, the rolling hills in Morrisville area. Um, mm -hmm. And rightly so is trying to, Put cover crops to save a lot, a lot on soil erosion, uh, but he's been pretty successful using that unit to basically mm -hmm. push down that winter uh, grain and mm -hmm. uh, come right back in with Roundup like immediately. Sure, you know, yeah, uh, to, to kill it. Um, mm -hmm. And and that's you're rightly uh, your comment as far as having uh, a bunch of agronomists and and field crop producers have different opinions mm -hmm. about planting green. Mm -hmm. And I think your conservative approach, especially heavier soils where it's really questionable whether you're going to get in in a timely fashion every year is, is you know, based on that kind of situation, uh, definitely have some growers in this area that have well-drained soils, smaller mm -hmm. acreages. And so they find that window to be able to go in and plant green, but mm -hmm. quickly come back and kill that crop, the cover mm -hmm. crop. So you're right in pointing out uh, the risks involved and, mm -hmm. and each grower is going to be on that spectrum of, uh, you know, whether they can 
take that risk in most years and accomplish what they need to plan in green or whether they should stay away from that practice. So, you know, you, I can, I've dated myself as to how long I've been at this, Jeff, and I know you've been at it longer than I have. So if you think back to the earlier days, we certainly, if we were trying to no-till, you know, back 30 years plus, we no-tilled into a cereal rye stand, how fast were we coming back in there with either the, the Gramoxone or the Roundup at that time? And a lot of times back then it was the Paraquat because, you know, right. at, at that time glyphosate was pretty expensive. So we did, just didn't use it back then um, as the burn down. So, so our product of choice was, was the Paraquat. Right. And, you know, so that was the one we always did it. We hardly ever planted green because if you did and the corn came up, you know, or the soybeans came up, I mean, the Paraquat was definitely going to be taken off the, the, the table. Then, you know, now if we're using Roundup Ready soybeans or Roundup Ready corn, we don't have to be as quick coming back in, right? So we right. can plant it. You can plant green. If you're using those Roundup Ready tolerant crops, you know, okay, if they do come up, that's fine. It's, you know, it's the, you know, what happens. And we had one just this past spring. Um, we had a farm that had annual ryegrass. They planted conventional corn, planted green conventional corn into, um, into annual ryegrass, had a breakdown with a sprayer, had some issues had conventional corn come up in, in a plant green situation with annual ryegrass. And so needless to say that outcome doesn't turn out very well because it was very, it's tough to kill when it was that tall. So yeah. again, and, and that, I, that's just the, some of the plant green stories that we can have. And then we can talk about, you know, the, the, the growers that have planted green into uh cereal rye come back in, you know, a few days after planting the corn spray it with gramoxone or not gramoxone. Well, gramoxone, if it's not up yet or glyphosate and the army worm move over from the cereal rye <laughs> over to the corn after it's <laughs> yeah. up. So we have right. those as well. So, right. yeah. So we have a lot of stories we can tell. So again, yeah, that's, that's my conservative thing just because of a lot of the, the bad experiences that, you know, that, that people have seen and, and we don't get called out to those experiences for people that kill it ahead of time. That's just my case. Yeah. So. And then just to be the devil's advocate mm -hmm. um, sure. on the opposite side of the coin, you hear the, the discussions from farmers, especially no-till farmers mm -hmm. that uh, kill uh, a cover crop pre-plant and then get skunked for a little while based on weather and then go back in there and have a bunch of problem with root balls, et cetera. So there's, there's that side as well. And I think Aaron uh, Gabriel was pointing out those mm -hmm. issues as well. Mm -hmm. So it is, it, it becomes a timing issue. You know, if you mm -hmm. can look at the weather ahead of time, know your land, you know, whether it's well-drained or not so well-drained and how quickly you can get things accomplished. I think that's a big part of planning a successful program. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can definitely go in with something like Roundup. <clears throat> like you said, it's not a fast acting product. It's going to take, you know, 14 days to really have an impact uh, versus Gramoxo in the afternoon that you spray, you see everything yellowing up and, mm -hmm. and it gets, you know, uh, let's say stemmy and stocky pretty quick if you're shut mm -hmm. out from the field for a period of time. So it's really knowing those aspects and trying to plan your herbicide slash um, uh, timing, planter timing accordingly, whether it's immediately following a kill or, uh, you know, planting and then trying to follow as quickly after uh, planting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I always, you know, approach everything, you know, with, with growers that we need a plan A, we also need a plan B. <laughs> And then you also have that, that plan C in the back pocket, because sometimes we have to pull that out and go through all the scenarios of what could go wrong, because, you know, when it does go wrong, we want to be able to have an answer for it and not, you know, box ourselves out because we've, you know, just didn't think of that scenario that it would never happen. So yeah. I guess we can never say never in field crops, right? Right. Uh, so with that, are there any other questions for Mike? This is your chance to... Uh... Type in uh, to the chat box with whatever questions you may have. Um, I will say, uh, if you'll yield the screen, Mike, I'm going to mm -hmm. put up the sure. <clears throat> last pieces of information here. And I'm going to ask folks to uh, 
do what they did at the very beginning of this program. So go to the chat box again, click on that chat box, go to the bottom, go to where it says type message here and enter your name first and last and your pesticide certification number in there now. So it's gonna take a couple of minutes. We're gonna wait for you to do that. Hey Hunter, Mike. this is Josh. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Janice. Go ahead, Josh, I'll wait. No, I was just gonna say uh, to the comment of um, Clover burn down, it seemed like um, the product that I seen that had uh, worked pretty well in combination with like the dicambas and the roundups was basis blend. Mike, have you seen that too? Going to corn? Yeah, I've not seen it on the clover. We've seen a lot of basis and basis, basis and basis blend has used, you know, in some burn down situations with some minimum till and, and some no, no till, but I've not seen anything that, and we'd be looking at the rim sulfuron in there for the, for the activity on the red clover, but I've not seen that. Um, you know, it could very well have it. Um, I've just not had any experience with it and I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. It's John. Um, have you seen anything, any activity or have any data on that, John? Uh, not, not for, not for red clover, but I would add in, um, uh, as far as a tank mix, um, for annual ryegrass control, we saw pretty good activity and improved control on bigger annual ryegrass, um, by including rim sulfuron with, um, with glyphosate. That, oh, okay. or, so right, so right now, I mean, just based on our latest data set of looking at it, um, select, so, you know, select or rim sulfuron as a tank mix partner with glyphosate provide a better, better control than, you know, either a high rate of glyphosate alone or with, um, uh, with like glyphosate plus sharpen. Okay. Yeah. That's good to, good to know. So, and what's the, and I don't recall off the top of my head what it was, but so if we use select before, so if we did that in the spring on some annual ryegrass, do we have any plant restrictions? We don't have any on corn, do we? We should be okay. Right. Yeah, I think we're okay. I'd have to look, mm -hmm. verify that. But yeah, yeah. I mean, we're going. You know, we're so, but we're we're trying to. We're probably not going right up to planting, not wanting to go right up to planting. Anyways, we're trying to get in there and kill it. Annual ryegrass in particular, we're trying to get in there and kill it pretty mm -hmm. early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mike, do you have any experience with uh, oats versus spring barley? I've got about 60 acres of spring barley and with the idea that it might die. So <laughs> experience on that. Oats, when was it planted? It, it, spring barley was planted last fall. Yeah, last fall. So spring yeah. barley, it shouldn't, yeah. It'd never make it up our way. We can't. We have a hard time getting winter barley to make it up in the North Country. Um, well, we'll see what happens in the spring. Thank you. <laughs> You must be way in the south. John Wallace might be able to get away with some of those spring crops, right? You guys can handle those down in, in balmy Pennsylvania. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, I wanted to ask if you <clears throat> have seen any differences with triticale or wheat in terms of how hard they kill with your recommendations that you had for rye. Yeah, wheat would be a little bit tougher. I mean, we don't see a lot of people killing wheat per se, because if you're going to grow wheat, you're going to, you know, there's, there's too much value in the, in the straw and in the grain that we don't see it typically killed or terminated. But if you did, um, the glyphosate would be a little bit tougher to kill wheat. Um, it's a little bit more tolerant to it. Um, triticale, I've not seen any differences when I've used um, any of those same programs on triticale or, or rye. Um, they seem similar. Um, and I don't know if anyone else has seen anything, if John's seen anything different than that. I would agree with the with the wheat. We have some guys. You guys are talking about planting green. We have some no tillers that like wheat and for for planting green because it doesn't get away as quick. Um, and yeah, we, you know, our recommendations would suggest that wheat might be a little tougher to knock down, especially as it gets bigger. Um, I don't know where triticale would fit in there as far as sensitivity if it be closer to rye or 
or wheat. Um, and I don't know of any data that's kind of parsed out those winter cereals. Yeah. And if you look at really, if you think, if you think back as to why we'd be planting triticale versus rye for a, for a plow down, rye just seems to be a little bit more available seed, a little bit cheaper. Um, so I think people are going to do that. If you're going to do triticale and many times we're not seeing it, you know, plowed down unless it was a poor stand or had a little bit, uh, a challenge getting through the winter, but usually that's going to be planted to be harvested for forage and then, then followed by corn, you know, a, a later planting of corn after that in June. So, 